it's Victoria for Taiwan TV and I'm here in New York at the Web Expo and I had the luck to meet again Jeff Jarvis who yeah we met in Hamburg at the next yep. conference and tell me yes yeah, so far you are working on a new book which is um, will be called or will be around beta yes tell me about it. Um, I'm still playing with the idea and so this is kind of the alpha presentation of it today just the ideas uh, and it's an idea that I had in what would Google do my last book it's an attempt to uh, say that as we move from the industrial age, and this whole idea that everything's a product that has one chance to be right, we've learned in technology that no, that betas are really, a, or betas, are really a great way to uh, open up your process to your public and learn from them. Mm -hmm. When you release a product as a, as a beta, you're saying this is not done, it's imperfect, help us finish it. Mm -hmm. uh, that is a call for collaboration, That's a, 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 it's an act of openness, and it's an opportunity to listen to your customers and your public. Mm -hmm. The beta phenomenon was uh, yeah, something or is something which we know from the internet industry. Uh, so would you say, would you recommend that now for all kind of industries? Well, the argument is made uh, as it was today here at Web 2.0 that you don't really want to drive a beta car if it's going to collapse. And that's true for the brakes and the tires and the things that matter. But why not have a way to update your car? My iPhone, you know, is constantly updated. It's hardware, it's real, but the more you can make it software inside of that, you know, great things come out of this. Um, uh, I, I think most anything can open up its process this way. Mm -hmm. Okay, so which business models go along with that? Software as a service, which others? Mm. Um, yeah, but I think it's just a, it's a change of attitude. It just okay. says that when we, when we create a product, the sooner in the process that we can bring in our public and our customers, the better. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I really mean here, is that if you, if you don't listen to your public until after okay. the product's done, okay. it's too late to get smart with your customers. So how do you move up earlier? Well, if you're lucky enough to be able to put a product out and learn from that experience, that's ideal. Mm -hmm. Now, if you have a jet engine or a car, maybe you can't do that. But with a lot of products, you can. So we already heard that today many t uh, several times about the customer-centered approach right now. That's the shift which is happening. Are mm -hmm. you saying the same? Oh, absolutely. I think so. And I think we learned that from all kinds of places. It's always been you know, the gospel that you, you, you preached, but we didn't really believe it a lot of the time. But a company like Google uh, really does constantly worry about the customer and the public. Uh, but it's always been true of good companies. You just do it. It's a better relationship. Mm -hmm. So that means I crowdsource kind of uh, yeah, the finishment or the continu continuously development of my product to my customers. Um, but how will we, they be recognized in the value chain then? Uh, because I want to have them as paying customers also. But mm -hmm. if I, if I yeah, use their feedback, I don't know. You, you know. I think there's all kinds of examples of products where the customers have given input uh, just because they're generous. They give it free, it's free value. Mm -hmm. I said today that Wikipedia gets hundreds of millions of dollars worth of labor just to its edits. Mm -hmm. Well, those people don't get anything back for it, they contribute value to it. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that's what you have to be set up for is to, is to recognize that value that people will give you. Mm -hmm. They'll give you value in the form of just good ideas. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you uh, you think that there will be no problem at all that the customers feel kind of abused or something? I don't think so. I think if they do, they can buy somebody else's product or do something else. I think, mm -hmm. look at it this way. If I have a choice of two products, this one is finished and done, they never listen. This one, I know that they're listening to the public and that people are helping improve it. That alone is a better brand message for that product. I might identify myself much exactly. more with that product. Exactly. Okay, interesting approach. Uh, Tim O'Reilly uh, today quoted you with the saying Great. of um, uh, do what you are best in and link, link to, to the, the rest. rest. <laughs> so explain me, explain me more about it. It's really a lesson that I've learned in media and journalism is that we used to have to deliver the whole world to you, but now that's too inefficient. We can't afford to do that anymore. And in fact, the internet demands specialization. So you have to do what you do best and then not do the rest, link to it. Um, and in fact, that's also an ethical matter that you're saying that this person did something good and I'll send you there and they'll send something to me. It's kind of a golden rule that comes around the link. Is that also about outsourcing? Yeah, it's partly that. It's partly that, that you can um, decide what your best value is, where do you add the most value, and then you point to others for them to do that. Mm -hmm. and, and specialization brings efficiency, mm -hmm. it brings higher targeting, higher value, so it's really about specialization. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what would be the hint out of that for startups? 
Ah, well, startups, every startup I know, we all know, is that they try to do everything, and at some point they've got to pull down and say, this is what I'm going to do really well. This is what others don't do, or, or I can do better than them, and if I try to do 10 things, I'll do each one badly. Mm -hmm. So they have to specialize in what they do. The other thing about startups, too, startups are, are beta. They are beta. They, that's what they are. And they have to learn what they are as they develop. Uh, any good startup I know started with one vision and then ended up with a different vision. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's what matters. So you recommend also for startups uh, not being just beta in their product, but also staying beta in their mindset? Exactly, exactly. Now, you still have to release something that's useful to people. You still have to come up with a product that's good, mm -hmm. that you stand behind. You can't stand behind the excuse of, oh, it's only a beta. Mm -hmm. um, so that's all true, but at some point, you always have to learn. You always have to realize it could be better. You always have to admit that it's not perfect. There is no such thing as perfection. And you, and you can always make something better by listening. Mm -hmm. As you are a journalist yourself and you are teaching journalism, what is your position related to the topic of paid content? Ah, uh, yes. I, I, I did a talk at uh, the uh, uh, Medientage in Munich. Mm -hmm. and, oh, you um, had that very troubleful discussion. Yeah, I, I, I caused trouble. Yeah. Uh, I don't think paid content is going to work. Uh, I'm not against it. It's not a religious matter. But uh, there's always more competitors. Um, uh, news itself is a commodity. The information becomes a commodity very quickly, it's very fast. Uh, if you're Reuters or Bloomberg or something like that, you can sell value to a trader who needs you know, 10 seconds advantage. But then it just becomes plain old information. Mm -hmm. and, and the idea that you can put up walls, well, part of the problem with the news industry right now is we don't have enough audience, we don't have enough engagement. This is the wrong time to be building walls. It's not going to work. What's happening is old media companies are trying to protect their old models. They're not updating for the new realities. And they're going to die. They're going to kill themselves if they put up walls. And so then startups will come in and replace them. But do you already see some new options arising related to yeah, uh, getting revenue streams? I just did a big project uh, that's still underway at City University of New York where I teach in new business models for news. Sorry, there's a bug there. <laughs> Uh, and uh, what we saw was that news company, there'll be many more companies and there'll be smaller companies, but it'll add up to, we think, a lot of news. Uh, we found hyperlocal bloggers um, in the U.S. that are bringing in $100,000, $200,000 advertising revenue a year. We think you could improve that by creating networks and better products and so on. So the point is, it's possible to earn a living as an entrepreneur in news today. Well, if you believe that, because it already exists, then you see a new ecosystem of news. News is no longer controlled by big companies, but by many, many, many little companies. Now, that's disorganized, so there are opportunities there to put together networks and to make that more efficient and, and put together ad networks and, and so on. I think I'm very optimistic about news. Uh, I think I'm very- so, But what you say is that it's still going to be advertising? I think it's mainly advertising, but there's a lot of other opportunities too. Um, uh, there's the notion of membership we've heard where, where people contribute money because they want something done. Uh, there's e-commerce, selling products directly to your customers. Um, there's things like having events like this, bringing people together around a topic that so matters. almost the same like in the music industry, that it's more event and, and experience for Some people? of it, a little bit of it. There may be a little bit where you kind of buy a ticket to get a performance, yes. But there's also the advantage of being at an event like Web 2.0 is not so much people like me blathering on the stage, it's that you see your friends and you meet people. And so sometimes if a newspaper, if journalism helps organize a community's knowledge, it also should help organize community's interactions. The internet is not a publishing medium, it's a connection medium. It's a way to make connections. So if we think of ourselves that way, uh, I think we can rethink by bringing together uh, data and events and, and uh, uh, teaching, education. There's a lot of other opportunities for journalists, I think. And you are teaching that to your students? Yes, I mean, uh, we're trying to f rethink journalism every day. Uh, I teach at the City University of New York and we try to teach the students to have a new relationship with their public. And part of that is that they may be educators. They may help people do journalism alongside them. Interesting, very interesting. So thank you very much for your insights. Vielen Dank. <laughs>